Good afternoon. I'm Chip Partner, Assistant VP for Communications for the University of Rochester Medical Center. Earlier today, URMC announced that we are joining two national clinical trials testing hydroxychloroquine, an FDA-approved anti-malaria drug for treating hospitalized and non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Amid a recent swirl of contradictory reports, these randomized controlled, trial, controlled trials are designed to provide clear and conclusive evidence that can guide future treatment of COVID-19 patients. We're joined in our studio here at URMC by the principal investigator for the Rochester arm of this study, Dr. Michael Kiefer, who's a professor in the Department of Medicine's Infectious Diseases Division and uh, interim chief for infectious diseases. And Dr. Kiefer, we'll invite you to say a few words before we open it up for questions. Okay, well, thank you. I'm be happy to, to be here. Uh, I'm a, uh, I guess I'm a converted uh, HIV researcher um, that uh, uh, has been called on uh, to uh, join the fight against uh, COVID-19. Uh, all of our uh, research groups throughout the, the country uh, have uh, transitioned a little bit towards this focus. And uh, so we're getting our fir uh, first uh, experience with a, a COVID-19 therapeutic trial here. All right, thank you very much. And um, first to sign on today was Will Astor, a Rochester Beacon. So Will, we've unmuted you and uh, you get to ask the first question. Yeah, um, Dr. Kiefer, um, there, there's there been uh, uh, some uh, information that th this uh, drug could be uh, harmful, uh, cause heart arrhythmias. Uh, can you screen for that, and what precautions are you taking uh, to to prevent that complication? Yeah, that that's very important, and precisely why we need to do this in a uh, controlled uh, setting uh, with close uh, observation for safety. But yes, we do screen people out who are at risk for these cardiac problems. So it it then technically wouldn't be a, a good treatment for everyone, but uh, the vast majority of people don't have these problems. So both kind of heart rhythm problems as well as uh, certain medications that can perhaps interact with hydroxychloroquine and cause these uh, uh, heart arrhythmias that, that can be quite serious. So we want to be very careful in doing this and watch people very, very carefully. And that's kind of why you just can't prescribe it and let people go out and, you know, and not uh, observe them very closely. And of course, you want to know that it works too, which is the other uh, primary goal of our studies. Thanks. Will, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, yeah. Why, uh, how did it come about that you're doing this at this time? Well, uh, this idea certainly was the first idea that came out uh, from uh, uh, smaller uh, French studies, uh, uh, probably about three months ago, and it does just take a little bit of time to get these types of uh, trials together. Um, and it looked quite encouraging with the very small studies, but uh, as usual, um, when you are early in an, in an epidemic or pandemic, and I can go back to the AIDS epidemic uh, with experience there, um, your studies are only so good, and, and they're really observational, and somebody tries something, and it may work uh, or seem to work, uh, but eventually you got to do the carefully controlled trials where uh, both uh, the, the patient and the doctors don't really know whether you got uh, placebo or the active drug. Uh, the, the patients need to be randomized, meaning you can't you know, put somebody in one group because they look a little sicker. You just put them all into the hopper and uh, they get randomized and enrolled to these different study arms. And then after a period of time, we get the results and we unblind it and say, oh, people did better, worse, or no different if they got the treatment, hydroxychloroquine plus or minus the second drug or versus placebo. And certainly during this time, before you get to the end, you know, you're watching both for side effects as well as beneficial effects and the, uh, there's an uh, uh, institutional review board or a data and safety monitoring board that keeps an eye on the results. Unblinded, they know who got what, and if they start seeing anything, really either good or bad, they can stop the study early. 
and we talked about that on um, remdesivir. There was a special meeting that our researchers feared right. might be something wrong, and it was that, but it was so encouraging that they they had a special meeting to right. So you can stop early for good reasons or uh, or disappointing reasons. Nope. Okay. I see Christian Garzone from Channel Eight has to leave us. So Jane Chaco from uh, Thirteen Ram TV, you're up next. Hi, uh, so I was wondering how the um, 200 people not in uh, hospitals that are participating, how are their, uh, uh, how are they being monitored, basically? Yeah, yeah so the, it was an agreement with the FDA when this trial was put together that we'd use a low, lower dose uh, uh, of hydroxychloroquine in these patients. Uh, referring to the dose, I should mention that the, the anti-malarial dose or the dose that's used for patients with uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis tends to be a little lower than, than the doses we're using here, but uh, this is not the case for the outpatient study. Uh, we're trying to do the study with minimal contact with the patient. They don't really have to come in and we don't really have to see them, but we're very careful about ruling out you know, the cardiac risk factors uh, up front. So, um, and it's up to 200. Uh, we may not be able to enroll that many uh, locally, but it's a total of 2,000 uh, nationwide. Jane, did you have a follow-up question? Yeah, uh, what results are needed from um, the, these two trials to prove that uh, the drug is effective? Or where are we going from here once the trial yeah. is done? I mean, obviously, if it's effective, because it's a pill regimen, it can be used as an outpatient remdesivir, which you know we've studied here and, and has shown some effect. That's an intravenous used for people who are sick or in the hospital or, or really sick in the, the uh, in intensive care units. Um, what we uh, really want to do is uh, add this to the armamentarium the, the uh, toolbox, <laughs> uh, uh, or, or discard it and move on. I mean, there's been a lot of effort with these particular medicines, and there, there's really mixed results of these trials. I mean, the trials that have been done aren't looking particularly encouraging, but the, 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 the gold standard trials really have not been done. And because there have been some studies that show possible positive results, good, good uh, outcomes. We want to make sure that we're not uh, kind of getting rid of a good option uh, uh, before we, we really know uh, what it can do. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. And I'll, I'll jump in before our next media question, Dr. Kiefer, because when we talked before, you mentioned that um, it's not just this drug alone or with the risk for myosin, but one of the things as an age researcher, you discovered you have to test different drugs in, in different combinations and see how they might work together. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's the huge success story of AIDS is we put together these research networks to do these trials from the very beginning. I remember in the very early days before there were really any medicines other than AZT and people would try almost anything, and you can't really blame them of doing that, but the, the key was to get them into these trials, find out what's good, what's not so good, and build on that, and you know, look how far we've come in, I guess it's uh, 20 years, 25 years. And uh, Brett Dahlberg from WXXI, thanks for joining us today. Hi, doctor. Um, I wonder if you can just kind of walk us through how this trial works, what the steps are, and what are different about the way that this trial is going than previous trials? Yeah. Well, the inpatient trial isn't particularly a whole lot different than the remdesivir trial that we did. Uh, basically, these are patients that are in the hospital. Uh, they need to have a positive uh, uh, coronavirus uh, PCR test within 96 hours of the time we get them started on, on medicine. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, our, our study team looks over the patients that have come in, tested positive for, for COVID. And then, and then actually, there are other research projects going on here, uh, both kind of observational and uh, the other remdesivir trial that is still uh, active. And we kind of decide which uh, patients might be uh, qualified for which of these studies. Um, because our trial, my trial, is, is placebo controlled. We certainly give the uh, participant and their family a choice of, of 
which study they they want to participate in if they if they uh, qualify for more than one. Also, something that's happened recently is we've gotten a supply of remdesivir uh, to use just outside of the study, and people may choose to do that. But we're hoping that enough people choose to go ahead and and do this trial. It's basically the inpatient trial is a a ten day trial of oral medication. Uh, just kind of along with the other medicines that they get during during this the study, we you know do the blood tests and certainly the inpatients it's a higher dose of medicine, so we are watching very closely with EKGs and uh, and then uh, we kind of finish in you know placebo controlled. We don't know who got what uh, quite frankly, and uh, that's the inpatient study. Then the outpatient study, we're finding people that aren't admitted to the hospital but have tested positive. You know, we're hoping you'll help us uh, spread the word about this because uh, we do want to reach out to people to get in shortly after they've been uh, diagnosed and uh, onto a similar type of regimen, only for seven days, lower doses, uh, with very close uh, telephone contact. Uh, this study, at least for the, the majority of our patients, won't require a study visit to come into the hospital and people that are sick with, with coronavirus probably don't feel that much like coming into the hospital unless they're staying here in a bed or something. So, uh, so uh, that will then be a weak treatment, same sort of thing. We'll follow them up uh, later, break the blind, see who got treatment, who got control, and then have our answers. Do you have a follow-up, Brett? I do. Doctor, you said that you uh, have been sort of conscripted into COVID research. You're, you're usually doing HIV research. I just wonder about, uh, I mean, either for you specifically or in a bigger picture, what is happening to research that's usually going on as we, as people in the medical field, focus their research so much in this one other area? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Conscripted, uh, uh might be a little strong. I'm, I, I came here actually to Rochester for my fellowship to research uh, respiratory viruses, and then I kind of got constricted into AIDS, but uh, that's fine. Things, there's been plenty of work, and I'm, I'm happy to be doing both right now. Yeah, uh, so there's a huge amount of uh, uh, COVID research that's kind of coming, including vaccines and then uh, antibody infusions and different types of uh, treatments, both for inpatients, outpatients, uh, prevention and treatment. So yeah, there's a lot going on, but still the HIV work goes on as well too. So right now, we're probably one of the few groups uh, hiring. <laughs> we're, we're looking for more people who are qualified to do these studies and to help with these studies. And because we've done the HIV research, essentially the clinical trials that you just you know, substitute a different drug uh, for a different type of patient, and uh, it's, it's fairly uh, similar. So we've kind of joined into this in a big way and it really are looking to expand both our, our team and outreach in the community and uh, we need probably additional space. We might be driving a mobile van around if we, if we can find one and that sort of thing. So both, uh, both work is going on, I guess, uh, business is booming, uh, at least for us, maybe the only place. And yeah, thanks. Dr. Cooper, just to follow up on that point, I know you mentioned that uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci in setting, who, whose career dates back to the AIDS crisis, yeah. set up all these networks with the idea that they could be assigned to different uh, diseases. Maybe you want to talk a little yeah, about Yeah, yeah. It was really uh, Tony Fauci's uh, vision when they set up the, the various AIDS networks. So when that came on the scene brand new uh, 30 years ago, they did set up these research networks, both with the scientific leadership as well as the people who could do the trials. And uh, there were a variety of you know, like HIV treatment, HIV vaccine, other sorts of uh, uh, prevention uh, modes. Um, and uh, these networks were, you know, have expanded around the world and uh, essentially are available, the plan was to have them available should something come along that needs uh, a lot of research capacity very quickly. So these, these networks are being repurposed, although we're not leaving our original uh, uh, work at all. And, and like I said, we're, we're really just scaling up at an uh, incredible rate right now. And I'll, we'll come back to all the reporters who are on the call today to see if you have any follow-up questions. 
one I expected, and I guess I, I will ask, is um, about President Trump. And maybe there's a two-part question here. One is um, he uh, declared very uh, publicly a couple of weeks ago that he was taking uh, hydroxychloroquine for preventive purposes. And will this study uh, and determine whether it's useful as a preventive yeah. drug in any way? No, that, that gets at a, a good question about the different types of studies. So both of these studies are for treatment, so people that already have the infection. But that's a very important area. And in fact, there are studies not here uh, that are going on looking at that. Somebody perhaps, you know, a lot of your viewers may be quarantined at home because they were exposed to somebody wouldn't it be good that they could be on a study uh, or on something to, uh, to see if they can prevent from, uh, from getting it? So um, I understand the, uh, the reason why he'd want to do that. And my guess is he's got pretty close medical follow-up, uh, I, I would imagine. But I wouldn't encourage that in general. I mean, we need to find out the answer so then we can move on. And certainly if it's harmful, um, you know, I, I, again, I think he's being watched very carefully. So uh, I, I imagine they'll pick up any side effects. Uh, but if all doctors just sort of start handing this out, uh, you could find more side effects than uh, beneficial effects. And my related question is whether um, you've given thought to the, the fact that President Trump has been vocal about it. And there's been a lot of um, public discussion about this particular drug. Does that complicate your recruitment in any way or do you? Know well, that? I don't know. I mean, we don't do politics really. I mean, we do the trials. Um, there might be some people really encouraged and want to join this for that reason. And there's, there's probably a lot of people who don't want to. And all the studies, you know, regardless of what they've shown to date says that doing carefully, you know, randomized controlled trials is needed in this area, no matter kind of what they feel about uh, the possibilities or, or their uh, preliminary results that, that are starting to show. But I've yet to see uh, anything in the medical literature that says, just toss this out and forget about it. I mean, we don't have the studies, we don't have the definite proof to say that's the way to go. And it would be a shame to toss out something that, that actually was helpful. Um, I see a follow-up question in the chat. If you could expound a bit, you, you mentioned the possibility of a mobile van. First, can we clarify that would be if it can happen for the hydroxychloroquine trial that you'd like to do that and then how how far along are you or how likely do you think that is to happen? Yeah, we're exploring that. I, I think it's really, you know, when, when we're talking about working particularly with patients that are COVID infected, we're trying to kind of visualize how we might go about that. And of course we don't, you know, we, we want to keep our hospital safe and the patients, you know, in their, their rooms. We want to have a separate area uh, to take care of COVID in, infected patients. And so we're working on that, but it just kind of seems that uh, if you're sick with uh, an illness like this, you might not want to hop in a car and come to the medical center or doctor's office or whatever. I mean, I've, I've heard patients say I'm too sick to come to the doctor. So, you know, so if we could go to them, that would be ideal. I mean, the alternative to a mobile unit might be just doing home visits or doing more home visits. And, and you know, so we're going to have to adapt to this to, to do what's safest for uh, the patients and the rest of the community and the, and the research staff. I see uh, Brett Dahlberg has a follow-up question. Do, do we want to unmute Brett, please? Oh, Chip, that was my follow-up. Oh, I thought, uh, did you, well, uh, I thought you were looking for, oh, that was from Will Asker. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Will, are you there? Yes, I am now. Um, can you comment on, on the uh, Lancet, uh, uh, the study the Lancet published, which has garnered quite a bit of publicity, all of it negative? Sure. Um, yeah, that's the one I was just referring to that I, I reread the, the last couple paragraphs. <laughs> and it said randomized controlled trial. This was a big study, big observational study mostly U.S. Uh, and, and basically just from the experience of treatment uh, providers in hospitals, and it was all hospital 
hospitalized patients and and just collected the data on uh, the information that that uh, um, you know what patients got, and you know there are all sorts of doses of hydroxychloroquine. You know, so there, it was it was very jumbled. Uh, and when they got started in relation to to their presentation and all that wasn't clear. They did a pretty good job of doing their best to kind of tease this out and and controlling for confounders, but. Uh, at the end, they say, you know, there could still be problems with this study. It's not a randomized controlled trial, and uh, it's not looking uh, uh, encouraging from this experience. And it was quite a large experience, uh, but it said we need to do these trials. I mean, that's that really was the gist of the paper. So uh, it certainly gets us uh, really focused on the, the cardiac uh, uh, problems that can occur, though. I mean, that's that's good. Uh, evidence that this is a real possibility. Um, can I can I follow with one more on the cardiac? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, you mentioned before that you're going to be screening or attempting to screen people out. Is there a possibility there could be people uh, with an undetected uh, condition, or is it is an underlying condition even necessary? Uh, to uh, evoke these uh, yeah. arrhythmia. Well, usually that happens when they're on uh, medicines that also work the same way to cause these cardiac arrhythmias, uh, rhythm uh, effects. Um, to date, it really looks like having a history of, of those uh, uh, illnesses or uh, cardiac manifestations, uh, rhythm problems. So even if it's a different type of cardiac palpitation or something like that, we wouldn't enroll really anybody with anything that uh, uh, smacks of, of uh, cardiac. Uh, I imagine a lot of the outpatients are going to be younger people, you know, because they haven't been admitted to the hospital, less likely to have uh, uh, complications, so they'd have less com comorbidities. The inpatient study is very closely observed with all the EKGs and the, the daily monitoring. And Likewise, the dose is a little bit higher there too. So um, anything we do has to be reviewed by the FDA going into it and making sure it's acceptable to them with, with regard to safety. There's actually quite a large amount of data from chloroquine, not hydroxychloroquine, but chloroquine and azithromycin for use against malaria in, in Africa or other parts of the world. And it's felt that hydroxychloroquine is less likely to cause this problem than even chloroquine. And there's a pretty huge evidence of uh, chloroquine of uh, cardiotoxic to uh, kind of the, the normal healthy uh, adults without, uh, without uh, problems with uh, uh, cardiac rhythms. Yeah. So that that really uh, clinched the I think the FDA's opinion to allow this to go ahead as as it's designed. I need to pause you there, Dr. Keeper. We're having a uh, technical issue. Can you see? I didn't see you. Oh, you didn't see. Okay. Um, is can we unmute uh, Brett or no? I'm gonna walk out. Right. I think it's just like frozen. Our, our screen just froze, and we're not sure if you can still be seen and heard. Um, this is Brett. I've, I've got you all just fine. Okay. All right. So, um, well, uh, Jane, we will unmute you in a second. I have no control. Oh, all right. We can't unmute anyone. And I think, I assume you could chat in, Jane, if you have a question. I have a couple of final questions. Oh. And thank you, Brett, for letting us um, know that you could see and hear Dr. Kiefer. Um, you mentioned the outpatient portion of the study, Dr. Kiefer. I wondered, is this um, the only drug that right now is being tested as a potential outpatient therapy for um, COVID-19 patients who can recover at home? Yeah. Yeah, yes. It's the only at the moment. Uh, there's another study with uh, uh, convalescent plasma. So people who've gotten over the, the illness donate their blood and they have antibodies in there. Um, we're going to be starting a trial of, of that with outpatients within a couple of weeks or a month, maybe. I, I'm not exactly sure. So at the moment, true, this is the only outpatient study we have locally. And that gets to my related question. You said this is a pill, like yeah. any other pill you might get at Wegmans Pharmacy. 
convalescent plasma would actually would obviously not be that remdesivir is not that is are there other therapies that are as simple as taking a pill that are being researched right now oh yeah there's about a thousand uh clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov that are interventional trials and uh you know there are some some things coming along i mean there's an incredible amount of work we tend to work through our nih uh, uh sponsors through the the uh, you know tony fauci's uh, research groups and so Ideally, the the best options are coming through there, but there there's a lot else uh, going on, and the potential that uh, there's you know as early as a month or two from now there may be something new on the horizon that looks particularly good. So, we just want to get these trials uh, started and ended, and uh, on to the next uh, you know, and then hopefully these things will be effective and, and go into the treatment uh, uh, um, um, toolbox. Last question for me is I think uh, we're, we've got a new unfrozen computer so we can see chat. Um, how do you ensure that minority communities are properly represented and you know as a portion of the population and a portion of the trial? Yeah, uh, we'll uh, reach out as we have. I've worked in a long time with, with HIV and of course that disproportionately affects uh, people of color and and built a lot of uh, kind of connections in the community through some of the churches and uh, and uh, uh, also kind of healthcare providers and our Center for Community Health also is very well tied in with the community. Uh, and the van or the mobile unit would be uh, would give us additional ability to get to where uh, the people are. Uh, even if we don't get that, we would uh, even consider uh, putting up tents and parking lots and that sort of thing and uh, so all of this is kind of uh, we're brainstorming as we go and trying to roll these things out and, and get them going so uh, really we're accepting any sort of ideas so if, if there are connections of people in the in the audience who would, would like to get a hold of us to bring us in to uh, work with you and this will probably be even more important with vaccine studies that come down the pike uh, in a few months so uh, but again, the uh, treatment trials, uh, if you are found to be infected through one of the nasal swabs, it's very likely we'll be calling you. So, and we frankly don't know what you look like. So we're calling everybody, so, okay. And um, just in time, as we restored chat, Jane from 13 Wham TV has a question. If the drug proves effective, how fast would it be given to other patients in Rochester and how does that process work? Well, it's it i mean it's uh, very quickly because it kind of almost has a jump start so um i think most most rochester physicians are not using it and preferring to wait to see what the trials show and and then with the more recent information on the toxicity i think they're even less likely to use it but i there is a stockpile of it i mean there is plenty of it. So if this uh, proves to be effective, I mean, this would probably go into, uh, you know, general use very quickly. And th that gets to a point you made um, very early on in today's conversation, remdesivir, um, which proved fairly quickly in its clinical trial to be helpful now is available, not as part of a trial, but just as a medicine for ICU patients yeah, across we've, the UR medicine system. I think we've got doses for like 100 patients or something like that, 100 treatment courses or, or something like that. So, yeah, of course, people, you know, can, can get what's, I mean, this is how research works. They can get what has been proven to work so far, like AZT in the old days, or they can try the next combination, which might be better. All right, I want to say thank you very much. One note I wanted to say is that um, Dr. Kiefer is unmasked today because everyone else in our crew in the studio is masked and when there's only one person and we're socially distanced, we're allowed to let our speaker, uh, thankfully for him to be unmasked. I want to thank uh, Dr. Mike Kiefer, the principal investigator for the hydroxychloroquine study at the University of Rochester Medical Center for joining us today and explaining this so clearly. Always thank uh, Morgan Underwood and Will and Chris, our ASL translation uh, team, for joining and making this event more accessible. Thank the media for joining us. My colleague, Suzanne Palo, who put together all the materials. Um, we should note for our um, television uh, colleagues that there is B-roll available. If you did not see it, we have uh, some B-roll of, uh, of the drug. And I wanna thank uh, Jeff Mead for running the camera and our Zoom today. With that, I think we can call this 
concluded and end the meeting for everyone. Thank you all. Thanks. You did perfect. That was just great. Great. I think. Uh,